Oh, hi. Hey, Toasty, how you doing? it look like? It's a construction zone on the space station. Yeah, but why? Upgrade. Well, what was wrong with the old one? It was old. Hey, speaking of which, uh, being that you're kind of old yourself, I was thinking maybe some upgrades for you be nice. How about an auto oiler or a jacuzzi hot bath recycling plasma? Ah, we'll talk about it later. Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. Today we've got a great guest, Sandy, and her film, My Life in Minutes. But well, we can talk about this thing though, because that actually sounds pretty sweet. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of into that, so let's talk about that, yeah? Yeah, yeah sure. Hey, roll the Wi Fi. And if I roll the Wi Fi, we can talk about this, right? Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to it. Okay, but you're going to talk to me. You, you, you know, you're not going to jip me out here, because I, I, you know, th th that sounds really sweet. I'd like that, you know. You know so, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about this. So. Hey, yeah, 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 It is my pleasure to welcome to the show Sandy Wilson, award-winning writer and director, well known for her film, My American Cousin. Today we're gonna to talk about the Crazy Ace film in year 2000 called My Life in Eight Minutes. And I have to ask straight off the top, could you add eight more minutes? Actually, I couldn't fit it into eight minutes and so I think I changed the title to My Life in a Few Minutes <laughs> because it wound up going about nine and a half minutes or so. What did it? it yeah, it was over. really hard. It's hard to edit your life. Tell us about the film. What was the experience like? And, and so welcome oh. to have you. So, yeah, Paul yeah. Armstrong asked me if I wanted to get involved, uh, and Andrew Williamson mm -hmm. asked me if I wanted to do something for the Crazy Eights Film Festival, and it really appealed to me. And um, I've always kind of um, been interested in family, mm -hmm. especially me and my own family. Oh, why is that? <laughs> I think it's maybe because when I was a kid growing up at Paradise Ranch, we were at the end of the dirt road and there was no television or telephone or anything like that, but my dad shot home movies. So I was kind of used to watching uh, home movies. Hmm. So it just seemed like natural to make movies about my family. Oh. And so when Crazy Eights came along, it came shortly after my mom died. Hmm. And I felt like the rug had been completely pulled out from underneath me and uh, it would be a good time to uh, reassess my life and just sort of think, hmm, where have I been and where am I going? Which I had no idea what I, where I was going. Um, so that was kind of the impetus and I wrote a little script weaving around dreams about being a mermaid and, you know, always searching for something and, uh, you know, success and failure, how they're a little bit the same, you know, different sides of the same coin. Isn't that true? Mm. Yeah, so it was kind of an opportunity to do a little therapy via filmmaking. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. What was the process like? So you told us about that. But you, I understand it was only eight days. The format was a little oh. bit different then. Oh. It was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a freaking nightmare. It was really, really difficult because the eight days mm -hmm. happened to fall on the one week out of the year that I was teaching a teenage film class at the Vancouver Film School. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be dealing with the kids in the daytime and then trying to get the movie together uh, in the evenings and uh, because I wanted to go up to Lake Okanagan and pretend I was a mermaid swimming in the lake uh, I talked uh, WestJet into giving us a couple of uh, airline tickets and we flew up to Kelowna and then my friend picked us up in a boat and we went back to the ranch I put on my little mermaid outfit there lying on the beach and then um, you know had to come back and teach teenage film school the next day I was it was just that is and, fantastic. Yeah, I was crazy it was crazy, but it was an awful lot of fun. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Did you, no sleeping. Not much sleep. Yeah. Not much sleep. Uh, yeah, and a lot of worry. And um, my costume, which I had sewed myself, you know, because of the eight hundred dollar restriction on you know what you spent, I didn't realize that the fabric, when it got wet, would just sort of stretch and go kind of all globby. <laughs> so it was kind That's of hard. anyway, <laughs> unforeseen circumstances, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. 
And so it all came together, though, in the end. It did. Yeah, I, yeah we got. Uh, we had the opportunity to shoot in my brother's swimming pool in oh. West Vancouver. So that was lots of fun, and it was on a nice day. That's helpful. So uh, yeah. It happens at a good time of the year, then. Yeah. 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 Weather-wise. Yes. <laughs> we terrible crazy eights in January. Yeah. And uh, again, it gave me an opportunity to live out a little dream. You know that I'm a mer that I'm really a mermaid. Like, really? this is really a space station. It right? really is. I this have a badge to prove oh. it. And, and well, it's, 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 it's right there. Yeah. My oh, name's on I it and everything. See. Oh, sort of like once really it's imprinted, it's real, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's so, right. once it's embroidered on your head and covering another corporate name that I can't mention, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Once there you, you know. it's, it's real. Well, it's I've still got my mermaid fin. Really? Mm -hmm. We should go swimming sometime. Mm -hmm. mm. I'll okay. just make a pool in the back. Oh, oh Trust to make a pool. Really? <laughs> and he will? And they could yeah. yeah, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Virtual dive. Well, so you've got Earth just rotating in the back. <gasps> oh, let's nice. dive into the Mediterranean. Yeah, it's a long, nice. long, long drop. Wouldn't that, what about that guy that flew, that dropped out of the plane, though? Which one? Oh, the Red Bull guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson say? He says, yeah, that's really impressive. It's sort of like falling a millimeter on a tennis ball. Mm. They're like, oh. Okay, that's perspective. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Well, let's watch your film, My Life in Eight Minutes. Toasty, roll that Wi Fi. Pop it up. Act One The Beginning, The Easy Part. My father noted in his diary, October the 15th, 1947. Two loads of apples to town, the weather continues good. Catherine had a baby girl. They brought me home to Paradise Ranch. My grandmother moved to Paradise in 1915. It's where my father grew up, and it's where we grew up too. I was named Sandra because my mother liked the name, and Victoria after her mother, who had recently died. I guess you were the one who really was most just yourself, refusing to smile at Granny. Does that child never smile? My children all smiled. My children all had curly hair. My grandmother was a storyteller. She kept two human skulls in her basement. She said there were warriors in our family. My father warned me, Oh, Sandra, I'm afraid you come from a long line of strong women. Things won't be easy for you. I didn't care. I was young and filled with wonder. On my first day of school, there was another girl in grade one named Sandra, and Mrs. Kennedy pointed at me and said, you will be Sandy and she will be Sandra, so there won't be any confusion. But I was confused. I adapted to my new name, Sandy. We played in the lake all summer long. I was a mermaid, at home, beneath the surface. I wanted to be friends with the Ogopogo. In my dreams, I would discover heaps of treasure and then the big fish would come along, and I'd have to make my escape. I could only take the amount of treasure I could carry with me on my person. I still dream my watery dreams, just like when I was a girl. It was a heavenly time. We were blessed, and I was busy. I was going to be a teacher, like my dad, until I discovered boys and rock and roll. I wanted to be Calamity Jane, Doris Day, the country girl who cleans up beautifully in the big city, riding the range and going to fancy dances in town every night. I wanted to sing and dance and tell stories and live in New York City as a glamorous only child with parents who really loved me and took me out all the time. Instead, I was stranded on the shores of Lake Okanagan with three brothers, two sisters, weird parents, and the first Volkswagen in the valley. I was a cheerleader and the social convener at school. I stopped speaking to my family. With each new boy I fell for, and I fell so hard it hurt, I would try to reflect their personalities. Russ was a guitar player, so I was a groupie. And Mike was a good Catholic boy, so I went to maths and thought about becoming a nun, or maybe an interior decorator. I couldn't wait to leave paradise. For my last year of high school, I was shipped off to a Catholic girls' boarding school. One night, 
I got dressed up as a nun and we took this photograph. I was going to send it to Mike, but he got married to Anne and I was left with a broken heart and this photograph. I was a charter student at Simon Fraser University, living on top of a foggy mountain, going to classes in the clouds. Always feeling like the outsider, the girl from paradise. I wondered why Eve got blamed for Adam eating the apple. And why did Mary have to be a virgin anyway? It was a tossed up time of occupations and demonstrations. We were mad at the way the world worked. Some women came up from Berkeley and they talked about equality for women here at home. I was sitting at the back of the room doing my embroidery and it was as if a door opened and we were free to do anything. A friend told me there were some cute guys in a film class, so I signed up. It was intoxicating to make films and fly standby to film festivals and conferences. Money was not important. That was all BC before children. Act two. It builds on act one. It's a lot more complicated and it's all about characters in crisis and conflict. It'll be longer than act one and act three. I long to settle down and have babies of my own to have and to hold. I fell in love with Phil. He was an artist and we traveled to the Yucatan and Guatemala and moved to Hornby Island where we had our first son, Will. We built a cabin in the Okanagan. One day I heard a song on the radio and it reminded me of my American cousin. I could see the movie, so I started writing the script. Dear Diary, nothing ever happens. I got pregnant the same weekend I started writing and our second son, Matt, was born in 1983. The next year, we made My American Cousin and the movie Unmade Us. When we had a rough cut, Phil and I split up on New Year's Eve. I was forced to reconstruct myself. When tossed about on life's stormy seas, it's always been the women in my life who threw out the lifeline. My aunts, my sisters, my mother, loan officers at Van City Saving, and my gal pals. Sandra, as you get older, you'll see. Boys are like buses. If you miss one, another one will be along before you know it. Without them, I might have drowned. But I didn't. I felt the hand of those strong women and ancient warriors. And after a year in dark editing rooms, we leapt into the spotlight. And the winner for best director is that? Sandy Wilson, my American cousin. The mermaid from paradise was swimming with the big fish and picking up treasures. There's magic in the movies. We can give shape to our memories, to our dreams. We can live forever on the silver screen or on the digital tape. We can reach out from our hearts, tell our own stories, and reach millions of strangers all over the world in dark theaters. I know. I've been to Moscow, where they turn the sound way down. There's one actor at the back of the room, and he translates all the lines. Or Havana, Cuba, where mi primo americano was a hot hit. My American cousin took me around the world and back again. It was exhausting. Not to worry, didn't last long. The sequel was doomed and I felt like a woman about to deliver a stillborn baby. Set adrift and suddenly sandwiched between a father with Alzheimer's and two teenage sons who needed a parent. At football games, martial arts tournaments, the principal's office, ICBC Claim Center, and the emergency ward. (laughs) 
My father died in 1992. I gave his eulogy. I had to rehearse it so I wouldn't cry. My mother said she was never going to remarry again. No, all that fussing over supper. Why bother? She said she was better off on her own. And I agreed with her completely. And then, two years later, she married Jack Riley. And I got to be the social convener and the cheerleader. It was wonderful. The boys are leaving home, slowly. Jack died two years ago, and my mother died a year later, on December the 31st, 1999. She came to me in my mermaid dreams, asked me to let her go, and said goodbye the night after she died. Act three. Act three is the toughest one to write. You've got to sum everything up. Everything has to make perfect sense. It's very difficult to write your own third act. Besides, I favor multiple endings. I don't know what the future holds, but this is how my life looks today. There are a few details missing or glossed over, but uh, we wanted to get all our credits in.